Thank you, and, and very, uh, very much for having me here, and, and thank you all for being here. Uh, let me just show you uh, a slide, and I, I'm not sure I can see that there. That's Biosphere 1. Biosphere 1 is sort of the symbol of circular economy, if you think about it. It's been around for 4.5 billion years, and thanks to the stability of the Earth, all of us are around here. If the Earth didn't have the stable atmosphere and the stable lithosphere that it has, it would be like Mars, and it would not have the evolution that we've had in, in the biology, so that we would end up with a very short time in the whole history of the Earth where intelligent people, most of them, our president excluded, uh, have come up uh, to snuff. So one of the things that has happened in Biosphere 1, in the 4.5 billion years of evolution, is that it's had its up and down. Uh, in fact, the meteorites, there was a meteorite that came and hit the Earth and killed all the dinosaurs except for Barney, which is a bad, bad thing. And, uh, but other than that, the evolution has been sort of constant, except for now. Now we're in a time where we call it the Anthropocene, where humans are the ones that are changing the dynamics of the Earth more than any geologic or cosmologic way. And we know that because the rate of change that is happening today is extraordinary, giving, giving rise to what we call global climate change, and I think one of the reasons why global, why the circular economy is so important. 25 years ago, there, there were uh, a variety of free thinkers, which usually make things change in dramatic ways. And these free thinkers uh, created Biosphere 2. And Biosphere 2 is, is a laboratory for the environment, which is large enough that it can be scaled, uh, that things that happen in there can more or less mimic the cycles that the Earth has. It was supposed to be built so that it would control its atmosphere, that people could be in there and live uh, and grow food and uh, need nothing else but an energy to keep the whole thing going. And in fact, after the biosphere was built, again, 25 years ago, with the purpose of creating the knowledge to have the first circular economy, the idea was that everything in there was circulated, that people could live in there for, for years by starting with some original sort of growing their food, but it would keep on going after they did that. And that it would be in some ways the way that we would be able to go and colonize Mars or the moon or anywhere else if that was the case. And just to give you a sense of how difficult that is, in fact, and now we call this Earth systems, but how difficult it is to know how the Earth actually works, um, if you look at that thing, it, it, it's not only beautiful, uh, because one of the free thinkers that created it is, was an architect, is an architect, but it, had a, it has an ocean in there, it has a rainforest, it had an area where you grew food. But the problem was that they didn't quite figure out even though they had an investment in today's dollars of a billion dollars, that would have been the investment today, uh, they weren't able to figure out how the soils worked. And the soils sucked up all the oxygen so that the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere was equal to you living at 20,000 feet elevation, kind of. And they were not able to grow enough food for the calories that they were burning in, in there. So there were eight people after a week of not being able to breathe or eat very well, they became quite grumpy, and you ended up with two teams, which is another thing that's quite interesting about experiments like this, things that NASA now is incredibly imp uh, interested and worried about. How can you send astronauts to the moon or to Mars and, and live together when, in fact, their whole personality is a little weird? That's the only reason you'd go to the Mars, or the only reason why you'd be in here for two and a half years. How do you create teams of people that are all alpha? Think about it that way. So NASA spends an enormous amount of money on that, and, uh, and the very first experiment, which was done at Biosphere 2, showed how difficult that was. It wasn't created as a psychological experiment, but the experiment clearly uh, dealt with a bit of the psyche. What we do in the biosphere today, after 25 years, 
And interestingly enough, probably the most ex important experiment that was ever done at Biosphere 2, and again, we can do it because of its scale, is in the ocean, this was in the 1990s, we increased, this was after the, the biospheres were out uh, of the place, we increased the CO2 of, of, of the interior of the ocean, of the, at, of the biosphere, to levels that were 400 ppm CO2. And for those of you that follow global climate change and those kinds of things, today the Earth has a concentration of CO2 of about 400 ppm. In the 1990s, it was about 360. And the thing that happened immediately was that the corals all died in the ocean. They all bleached out. And it was an indication of the things that were going to be happening in the Earth today. There were experiments also in the rainforest that showed how, how uh, a rainforest can only take about 600 parts per million of CO2, and after that it cannot. Uh, so it's not an infinite sink for CO2. It's not a solution for, the, for global climate change. OK, I can do this too. Got it? OK, thank you. So, um, so what we do today uh, in, uh, the, at Biosphere 2 is research in four areas which are, we consider to be the grand challenges of the environment, three of them, and one, the grand challenge of, of humankind. We're dealing with the corals. This is this that says corals shows a picture of the of the ocean at Biosphere Two. It's the largest ocean inside of a of a of a building where we can control the temperature and we can control control the acidity. So we can create corals or systems of corals that can be resilient to the temperature increases that we have in the ocean, which is actually what's killing them. So even though plastics are a problem and and the acidity of the ocean, which has gone down, is a problem. The, the, the real issue that's, the, the number one issue that's, that's bleaching them is the temperatures. The second thing we're doing is in rainforest, as uh, there was a uh, talk this morning about Brazil and how it's so strange that in the rainforest in Brazil, it's, you get these droughts. What's gonna be the fate of rainforests around the world as drought kicks in? How much drought can a rainforest take before they start dying? And the scaling again at Biosphere 2 is such that we can do those sorts of experiments. The third one, which says water, is, is, uh, is trying to understand what, the, what is the fate of water in desert environments as you change the patterns of rain and vegetation changes. And that's a huge sort of if you're a researcher, can, you can consider it maybe boring, but it's incredibly important to quantify the fate of water in semi-arid environments. And the last thing we do is we're working on uh, food security and safety, the relationship of food, water, and energy. We have a program that's absolutely terrific in which we put solar panels, and this goes from schools to, 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 to places where you grow, Solar panels, instead of putting them in parking lots, we can put them where people, where food, where food is being grown. If you do that, and, and you live in a desert environment, then the shade of the solar panel will allow the food to grow without, with less water. The evapotranspiration of the plants to the panels makes the panels more efficient, because as panels heat up, they're less efficient. So there's a clearly circular re way that we have to deal with with food, energy, and water. The second thing we have is we have a scaling project in Mexico City in which we have a, a project where we have a, a variety of techniques for growing food that go from mushrooms to crickets to, uh, to vertical farms. One single farm in Mexico, in Mexico City produces about 40 tons of garbage a day. So we're creating systems in which we take the garbage, which is mostly organic food, organic material and uh, paper waste, dewater it so we can get water out of it. That takes care of about a third of the, uh, of, of the mass. And then we use the rest of it to grow mushrooms, which are an amazing source of protein. 
And what's left behind, we use it to grow insects, which is an enormous amount of protein there as well, and followed then by uh, using a vertical farm. And the important thing is that we, we get rid of about 50% of, uh, of the garbage that creates a lesser problem when you're trying to then uh, compost it. When they first tried in Mexico to compost everything that was coming out of the garbage piles, the flies became a real problem. People forget that. So you have to get the least amount of composting if you're not gonna create another issue, which is a problem that we don't wanna have. So at Biosphere then, this is a modern biosphere where we're doing these sorts of research projects. Uh, if anybody's interested in food, the way that I've described it, or coral issues, the way that I've described them, just give me a ring and I'll invite you to come and visit. It's truly an amazing place and in fact, but you can see by the way, you could have seen by the scenery, one of the most beautiful places in the world as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Aris, you can stay right there for yeah. a moment. We've got a, a couple of questions. Lee, have you seen a film called Biodome? Uh, sadly, yes. It's a terrible film. Sadly, it's a, yes. It's an awful film. But it's, it's kind of about two idiots who get trapped in Biosphere 2. That's right. I actually thought it was just a, a film. How do you make <laughs> sure that what you're learning now, the experiments that you're doing, how do you make sure they get out there and that people know about them, that other uh, that governments, that businesses, farmers can use what you're learning? Uh, it's, it's quite a challenge, isn't it? Um, so we do it in a variety of ways. Uh, uh, I'm blessed to be in a, in, in a place like this where I can describe what's going on because there are two sorts of populations right now in, in the world. Those that are about my age and think about the biosphere as a funky experiment with the eight people in it, uh, which is not what's going on now, and others which are much younger which don't even know it exists. Uh, so, so I spent a fair amount of time describing it to various uh, stakeholders to see who would be interested in being part of it. The, the U.S. government, the German government, we have a big project with the German, uh, various German institutions in the rainforest trying to understand how the rainforest works, again, because it's a unique enterprise. So the Max Planck Institutes are there doing their work. The, um, the corals is an international affair between, that includes people from Australia and people from Hawaii, people from, again, France. We have a big, big partnerships with France. So, so the scientists, the aficionados know about it. But I think that what we do there is so important that we, we need to expand uh, who we describe is, is happening with. I think the projects we're doing with Mexico City and those are just happening because we, we, we've been working with Mexico for a long time. The problems of the desert, lack of water, uh, resiliency, sustainability, are the problems that are gonna be happening in all the large metropolitan areas around the world, as it was said this morning. And, and having the knowledge that we have of, of dealing with food in, in an environment that's, that, that's a desert in, Arizona, in Tucson, we've had 4,000 years of food production. It's one of the oldest places in the, in the, in, in the U.S. where food production has been grown. In other words, there have been various native, uh, uh, native cultures that have been growing food there. And for that reason, the uh, uh, UNESCO has called Tucson a, a food city. It's not because of our great restaurants, which sadly <laughs> do not compete with London. But we have a history in which we have seed banks of things that can grow in the deserts. And we can take that kind of knowledge into, into cities where, there des where there's food deserts, for, in fact, and, and deal with those as well. And, and just lastly, we've heard a lot today about experimentation, approaches to innovation. This is a, a wonderful story. What do you think the, the moral of this story is? The moral of the Biosphere 2 story? The moral is, 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 is is the moral of, of what this foundation is trying to do. If you go through the natural uh, ways in which research and uh, these sorts of partnerships typically occur, where innovation is stifled, I mean, if one goes to the National Science Foundation in the US or the National Institute of Health, you more or less have to have the research done if it's gonna be funded. 
If you want to do high risk uh, research, which has a high chance of failure, like this is the beginning of the, uh, of the experiment at Biosphere 2, you need to have free thinkers. You need to have organizations like, uh, like, the, like the MacArthur Foundation, this one and the one in the US, <laughs> That, that take chances and, and recognize that those things that are gonna be transformative are unlikely to be done by the institutions that we have today. Ladies and gentlemen, Joaquin Ruiz. Thank you. Thank you.